Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for coming. My name's Claudia Hammond. Um, I'm a, a writer and broadcaster. I, I present All in the Mind on Radio 4 and Health Check on the World Service. So I'm very interested in, in tonight's subject. Um, and I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the RSA and the NSPCC for this evening's um, special event. Um, it is being filmed, so if you can put phones on silent, please, that would be great. It is being uh, live streamed on YouTube, so hello to people watching there. Um, and you will be able to see that video afterwards and you, there will also be audio appearing on the website in time and clips of the video as well if you want to, to relive it all again and again you can. Um, and the hashtag is uh, hash RSA NSPCC if you want to get involved in discussions on Twitter. And of course you can watch the event live right now as well. Um, and um, we do, do do that. So. Um, in my job presenting All in the Mind, I often, um, when I'm interviewing people about their experiences, find myself wondering why it was that life turned out for them the way it did um, and whether it was inevitable. Why is it that one person who experiences a really traumatic event might develop PTSD but another person doesn't? Um, and the nature-nurture debate has, of course, gone on for a long time and, and these days most people would agree that you know, it's, it's got to be a bit of both. But what are new are the ideas about exactly how it is that our genes interact with the environment um, and what happens to us and what our experiences are. So tonight we're very lucky to have a very distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor Moshe Schiff. Um, he's Professor of Pharmacology and Therapeutics at McGill University Medical School in Quebec. So he's, he's come all the way over from Canada. He's co-founder there of the Sackler Institute for Epigenetics and Psychobiology. Um, and he's, he's a real pioneer in this field and he founded the first scientific journal on epigenetics, appropriately called epigenetics. Um, and his trailblazing research has, has challenged, in a way, genetic determinism, showing that while our DNA is pretty much set, external factors such as toxins or the social environment can trigger this biochemical reaction in cells and that this can change the way genes express themselves. And he's applied his thinking in particular to the field of cancer, but might it also be applied to other areas of, of policy and practice such as uh, child development? Can we predict a child's trajectory? Is there some way of intervening? Uh, could we prevent something from happening later on? What can we learn from the latest scientific evidence in this field? So the shape of the evening is that um, the professor will um, give us his a lecture and then I've got some questions for him and then there'll be plenty of time for you to ask uh, questions too. So please do be thinking uh, what those are. Uh, but in the meantime, please do uh, welcome, please do join me in welcoming Professor Mosesha. Thank you. Thank you for this kind introduction, and it's always nice to come back to London, especially in this great room, and talk to you about something that I think is important and is going to change the way we think about ourselves. It's 150 years since Darwin published The Origin of Species, and almost the same time since Mendel discovered the laws of genetics. So for 150 years, and later the discovery of DNA, we believed that this piece of information, the DNA, encodes all the secrets of life. The Human Genome Sequencing Project believed that if we will sequence enough humans, we will find who is going to develop cancer and who is going to develop PTSD and who is going to be rich and who is going to be poor. It's all written in our DNA. However, the idea that DNA by itself is sufficient to explain the complexities of life has been challenged also a century ago. If you look at yourself, you have eyes and legs and, and livers and hearts, and they're all different, but they still have the same DNA. So how could one DNA have so many different forms? And actually, a UK scientist called Conrad, Conrad Waddington coined in the 40s the term epigenetics for the first time. His idea was that something happens to DNA during gestation that one cell, one DNA, the same DNA, can express itself in so many different ways. But he had no idea what happens to that DNA. When I started my graduate studies, our job was to clean up this DNA from anything else. This is how the DNA is packaged. 
This was packaging material. We got rid of it. Then we looked at the DNA, and there was the genetic code, the part of the DNA that actually uh, provides the information on the proteins, and the rest we called junk. And the idea was, during evolution, bad things happen, and we just accumulate this junk, but it's the genetic code that carries all the secrets. This was genetic determinism. It's still around, in spite of the fact that in the 40s as well, it was discovered that DNA is not just the genetic code, which is composed of four letters, G-A-T-C, but there are chemical marks on DNA. Hotchkiss discovered that in 48, but it went without any response that DNA has more than that. When I was a graduate student, uh, I uh, started working on those DNA marks, trying to understand what they mean, and many good scientists called epigenetics epiphenomena. We scientists have ways to deal with things we don't know. We just ignore that they exist. So DNA we don't understand is junk DNA. Chromatin we don't understand is gooey stuff. And epigenetics we don't understand is epiphenomena. And that makes our life very simple. And there's something really pleasing about genetics. The idea that you're born with good genes, you'll be good, whatever happens to you, you can throw that kid anywhere, he will be smart. And if you're born with bad genes, whatever you do is going to make no difference. You're born with the genes for wealth, you deserve your wealth. You're born with the genes for poverty, you deserve your poverty. It's a great life, almost no responsibility. However, we know, we all know that, your grandmothers told you, that that interaction has a huge impact on the way the human develops. It changes the phenotype of that human. We also know that this interaction doesn't happen in an empty environment. It could happen in this beautiful Miami suburb or in the slum of Rio de Janeiro. And also that has an impact on how that child will develop. So how does this work? What does it do? Is it real or isn't it real? So, following on Conrad Waddington's footsteps, we discovered that those methyl marks on DNA actually punctuate the DNA. And if you think about GATC as the letters of the DNA language, these are the punctuation marks, the overwrite, the underwrite, the put exclamation marks, so that the letters turn into a language. And the language is read in different ways in different tissues. So proteins called enzymes add those marks, remove marks, and this is sculpted during gestation. This is highly programmed, highly predictable, dictated by the laws of evolution. So if I now take a piece of DNA from a Neanderthal that died 20, 30,000 years ago, we can sequence the DNA and find his ancestry the genetic information, who his father and mother were. But we can also sequence the marks, the methyl marks, and know what tissue it came from. But being determinist, I was told when I was a graduate student that that process stops at birth, that nothing happens after birth. It's very interesting that we call development, when we study development, is anything that happens between conception and the first months of pregnancy. Then I met psychologists, and they call development something that happens during childhood. So we call development different things. But here is the big question. Is this DNA marked only by the innate processes of gestation? It's, as you know, highly predictable. Your eyes will be an eye, your liver will be a liver, your heart will be a heart. Or external forces can also take the same DNA and mark it in different ways. And therefore, two of you can inherit the same DNA and develop completely differently. So that was the question that we set out to determine. So before we go on, some basic science. How, those, how do those metal marks work? So this is the methyl group. It's added to base called cytosine, one of the four letters, in very particular positions in DNA. 
It's added by enzymes, so it's not an accident. It's an organized process. We are all methylated. It happened when we were developing as embryos. If this methyl group sits here, that gene doesn't work. And if it doesn't have it, it will work. And one of the reasons why this works like this, this is the same gene. But you see, these balloons are the methyl marks. When these balloons are present here, where the command for activating a gene is, is positioned, oop, sorry, just went back. Then the machinery that needs to express that gene cannot interact with it. And when these balloons are not present, the machinery can interact with it and activate it. So the same gene can be either active or inactive. And in every cell, it could be active or inactive. But does it, how dynamic is it? So I'll show you one experiment that will give you an idea that that process doesn't stop at birth. And actually, it can react to external signals. So we took neurons, these are the basic cells in the brain, put them in a tissue culture dish, and threw a chemical on these neurons called kinic acid, which is the same, which acts on the same receptors in the neurons that are acting now when you're listening to me, and asked the question, what happens to that DNA when it gets that information? Because if anything can happen in the brain, it has to go like this. We're secreting chemicals in response to social or other interactions. They act on receptors and neurons. And what happens to the DNA? Will it stay the same or not? So each line here is a different chromosome. You see, for example, chromosome X here. And whenever there is a change, if it's less marking by methyl, it becomes blue. If more, it becomes red. And you see, after two hours, the entire genome changed the way it's marked. Thousands of genes change the way they're expressed. But what you see here, and you don't have to be a scientist to see here, this, you see patterns. You see genes that act one way, sit next to each other. You see these genes act the other way, sit next to each other. And you see the chromosome X, most of the genes act in a similar way. When I looked at that, it suggested a few things. First, there is a response of the DNA to signals that operate in the brain normally. Second, these changes are highly organized. You can see patterns. It's not all over the place. And what it reminded me is as if the cell gets now an information from the world, is like a CEO decided to change a strategy of its company. This is the corporation, all these chromosomes, with thousands of genes on the chromosomes. Each of these genes is going to change a bit in response to that information. And if this is true, we have to start thinking about genes not as a final state, but as a steady state. Yes, we inherit a certain sequence from our parents, and we cannot do anything about that. And yes, during gestation, that DNA is marked in a highly predictable way. So, for example, if this gene is globin, which is supposed to produce the major protein in a blood cell, it will be not methylated in a cell that will become a blood cell, but methylated in other cells. So you silence it in other cells and not in this. If it's a gene that is supposed to work in the eye, it will look like this in the eye, and it will look like this in other places. However, it's still open for information that can come from the world and change that. Change that and tweak it in a way that can adapt the DNA to that information. And when I started thinking about this, first you think about toxins, then you think about food. Obviously, these things can have huge impact. But what about social interactions? And one thing we forget is the biggest chemical industry in the world is our brain. Our brain produces chemicals all the time. As we sit here, you are producing chemicals, and these chemicals are acting on neurons and on your DNA in your brain. So why not social interactions also acting in the same way? So that changes the whole concept. The gene is not deterministic. It's in some sort of a steady state owned by you 
and by your environment to act upon it in different ways. And if this is true, what does it mean about our genomes? Darwin developed the theory that he called natural selection. So what happens to genes? They change a little bit all the time. The sequence changes from one generation to the other. And then there's an environment challenge. For example, you know Eskimos who live in the north are short, and they have short fingers, so they don't lose heat. When I meet them in Canada, when it's minus 30, I need two pairs of gloves, they don't need gloves at all. They were selected to live in a cold weather. So natural selection was say, there were millions of people, one guy had this mutation by chance, all the other froze to death, that one guy survived, and that his progeny will have this kind of gene. But what we're saying here, perhaps that process can go in a different way. The cold weather acted on their genomes in a way that now directed the change that to respond to that. So that's an evolutionary timescale. It can also act in a transgenerational timescale, where one generation can pass to the next generation information through the germline on the experiences of that generation. For example, examples that are now emerging are traumas of one generation could be passed through the germline to the next generation. Food information. Was it famine? And I need to save every bit of food and turn it into fat. Or was it plenty? And I need to burn all the food. We need different genomes for that. It is a different corporation that has to deal with. Our genomes just don't change fast enough as far as natural selection goes to do that. And it's not a very effective process to kill everybody except the guy who has the right mutation. So lifelong timescale is what I'm going to talk to you about now. What is the information that the mother in a mammal passes to her offspring that shapes the life of that individual uh, throughout his life? There's life cycle stations. Puberty is an important one. What kind of sexual information do you get? Are you living in a co-ed environment, which means you have to be relaxed with your sexual behavior because there's going to be enough other sex around? Or are you living in an imbalanced environment where sexual aggressiveness is really adaptive because that's the only way you'll pass your germline to the next generation? So how are these informations passing on? This is a mechanism that can do that. There could be also seasonal timescales. We have a study where we looked at squirrels that freeze, hibernate during the winter in Canada. They change their entire genome. A genome that you need to use in the winter is not in the summer. They cannot change the sequence, because for this you need natural selection. But they can change the way the genome is marked. And it could happen at physiological proximal timescale. So essentially, epigenetics provide our fixed genome dynamic potential the dynamic possibility to react to the world. So let's talk about early life. A child is born to this world to three kinds of environment. The bioenvironment, which is all the other species around it, the physical environment, the length of the day. If you're born in Stockholm, your circadian rhythm, the way you, you make your genes work day and night is totally different than if you're born in Ecuador. The amount of food you're having needs a different DNA. If you don't have food, you better binge. You need to develop the brain to recognize food and binge. If you have a lot of food, you don't need to do that. And then, of course, there is the social environment. Are you going to be born in the slums, in a ghetto, where you have to fight for your life, where being hyper-anxious is really a life-saving property? Or are you born into an upper class, relaxed neighborhood where being aggressive is not considered social fitness? All of this is fed through early life on the genome, sculpting the genome to fit with that information. This is information that couldn't come about by natural selection. It just changes too fast. And that acts on the phenotype to adapt the child to that world. And actually, the epigenetic processes are not bad. They're good. They were selected by evolution to protect us. 
But what happens when we mess with this? For example, you can take four monkeys and put them in a room. It is exactly like putting four humans in a room or four mice in a room. You'll get number one, who is the boss. He will be trim and slim, like a Manhattan executive. Number four always overeats and is sexually aggressive. In the jungle, it's life-saving. Because number four will never have access to food. So the moment he sees food, he binges on it. He will never have access to sex. The moment he sees an opportunity, he becomes aggressive. Number one has everything. Doesn't need to eat. He knows the meal will come. Doesn't need to worry about sex. He knows that will come. He develops a complete phenotype. Highly adaptive. You take those monkeys, bring them to California, put them in a cage. Number one still stays number one, slim and trim. Number four becomes fat and obese, gets cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and it becomes a social misfit. So the phenotype that was adaptive in a certain environment becomes maladaptive in a different environment. Let's, let's think about humans. A human was born in an, in an aggressive, adversive environment because he was abused as a child. That child interprets it as adversity, biochemical, bioenvironment, envi uh, physical environment, and social environment. Whenever it sees food, it needs to binge it. Develops obesity. Why does it develop obesity in America or in the United Kingdom, but didn't develop it before? Because a McDonald costs $1.99. So the evolutionary signal here is misread. So the signal that tells you to binge, which was highly protective in the environment, the real environment, becomes highly unprotective in the environment that we live in. Being aggressive in a school in the United Kingdom or in the United States is not going to be fitness. Being aggressive in a situation where everybody wants to kill you is fitness. So our idea is that human disease is caused by actually normal adaptive processes that become maladaptive. So the, ure the eureka for me to understand that, I was a hardcore molecular biologist. I was interested in cancer, and I investigated DNA methylation in cancer. Cancer is a heart disease where we discovered that DNA methylation plays a very important role but I was never interested in social stuff. For us, social stuff was the kind of social scientists do, not us hard scientists. Till I met a colleague at McGill, and I met him not in McGill, because universities are, of course, built in a way that nobody will ever cooperate with somebody else. <laughs> However, we found ourselves in a bar in Madrid we're all traveling to a conference. We're talking to each other about what he was doing. And he started telling me that he was interested in that. What you're seeing here is maternal care in our evolutionary cousin, a rat. And if you looked at human, it's probably not that different. Humans and rats and monkeys and other animals, other mammals, do maternal care. And what he discovered was that they don't do it the same way. There's a natural distribution. Some do a lot of maternal care, and some do very little, and most do somewhere in between. And then what he did is separated those animals and asked the question, what happens to them later in life? And what he found was that they're totally different. The phenotype was different. He positioned it to the regulation of stress, which is the glucocorticoid receptor, Glucocorticoids are hormones that we secrete when we are stressed, but our, our body is built in a way that we secrete them when we are stressed, and then we shut them down so we're not stressed all the time. But these animals that did not receive maternal care were hyper-stressed. They were not able to shut down the stress response, which is very similar to what happens to humans in a similar situation. And we were sitting there in the bar, and in the beginning, Believe me, how rats do maternal care was not my primary interest. And, uh, but after, you know, alcohol, everything becomes your primary interest. And we were sitting and thinking, perhaps we are working on the same problem. 
is how DNA is changing in response to information. In this case, it's maternal love, which is the information that the DNA has to interpret. So we spent a decade, not before this following experiment was done. So when you see that, you see some rats do very little licking, some rats do a lot of licking. You ask yourself a question, why? So one explanation could be the Darwinian explanation. That rat has a gene that makes her a good mother, and that gene also makes the children, or the offspring, the pups, not stressed. And that rat has a gene that makes her a bad mother, and makes her offspring stressed. So Michael was looking and looking and looking for genes, and couldn't find anything. But then the obvious experiment was to take the children, the, the litter of the biological mother, and split it to a fostering mother. So you take children of what we call the low mother and divide it to a high mother and a low mother, and you do the opposite. And what they found was that this phenotype is not inherited through a germline, through our genes, but through maternal behavior. And generation to generation, the mothers are passing to their offspring the way they were raised. So how on earth could this happen? I am a molecular biologist. I believe there must be a chemical link between the maternal behavior and the DNA. And so we spend a decade on that. And this gives you some idea. This is a conduit by which a social experience early in life can turn into the way your genes are marked. The maternal licking and the grooming releases chemicals in the, in, the, in the brain, like serotonin, which activates signaling pathways. Signaling pathways are a series of proteins that get a signal from outside and start hitting each other, like chemically modifying each other, till they deliver a factor to the genome. The genome is a big place. And if you send information to the genome, it has to come to specific addresses. There are proteins that know to recognize addresses in the genome. So what they do, they take that information that comes from the mother and put it on precise addresses in the genome. And the more licking you get, the more the gene will look like this, open and active. The more less licking you, you get, it looks like this. But it is an equilibrium. The beauty and the promise of epigenetics on one hand, I told you, it passes from generation to generation. It starts early in life and it stays all life. It's stable, but you can change it. Because these marks are not part of the DNA. They are marks on the DNA. There are enzymes that put them on and enzymes that take them off. There's an equilibrium. So we went in with drugs that I used for cancer, drugs that we call epigenetic drugs, and we could convert this rat to look like this rat, or the opposite drug, take this rat, look like this rat. So we proved two concepts of epigenetics. One, there is a conduit by which the world, the social world, can send precise, accurate signals to the DNA and mark them on the DNA. But nevertheless, it is not final. It's not deterministic. There are ways to change it, chemically and possibly behaviorally. So the next question was, does it happen in humans? Do humans have similar things? So we had another collaborator at McGill, a psychiatrist called Gustavo Turek, and he had a brain bank of victims of suicide with which he was interested in, in studying and controls who he psychoautopsied. He collected information on their psychology when they were alive. And we asked him, do you have people who are abused as children? So we can look at their brain. So these were 35 years old, who were either abused or not abused, either committed suicide or not, and controls. And we looked exactly at the same address in the genome, the glucocorticoid receptor. And we wanted to see, so these are, there were 38 positions that could get methylated in that gene. And the peaks here are all specifically methylated in those that were abused. So here we have a mark that we can see at 35 years old, predicted by our rats in humans. It's not proof, because the only way to prove in humans that this was caused by child abuse is to randomize child abuse and then wait till the people die and then look at their brains. But we can't do that. But what we can do is look at our evolutionary cousins and see if we can predict something there 
and then look in humans and see the same thing. But the other thing that we saw, which is even more interesting, is that it's not specific to one gene. This is a whole area of the chromosome. This is where the glucocorticoid receptor is. But look at how many changes in methylation happen. I pressed the wrong button. And here we see a whole family of genes that we know are involved in, in, con in making connections in the brain that are methylated and less expressed in the people who were abused as children. So that child abuse leaves a broad mark in the DNA in a brain region that is called hippocampus. But again, in humans, we cannot random control such a study. Another great colleague is called Steve Sumi has been investigating this model for the last 40 years. What he does at birth, he separates rhesus monkeys and raises some monkeys with their mother and others in a nursery. They're both getting very high quality care. The only difference is they have a real mother, those have a surrogate mother, which is a combination of a human nurse and a cotton wool monkey. And when you look at these monkeys later in life, they have complete different phenotypes. The monkeys that were not reared with a mother will develop alcoholism. You know, when you give a happy hour to these monkeys, the monkeys that had a mother drink and, and that's it. The monkeys that didn't have a mother will binge to death. They're much more aggressive. They develop diabetes, they develop cardiovascular problems exactly like what we see in human population. So we try to see if that is limited to the brain or has signatures in other places. So I'll just explain you, see the red and, and the green. Each line here is a different gene. When it's red, it's methylated. When it's green, it's not methylated. You can see that the monkeys that had a mother and the monkeys that didn't have a mother look different. Their genes, hundreds of genes, are marked different. And we can separate them by this method, which is called clustering, almost as well as I can separate a liver cancer from a normal liver. And the other thing is that it happens in a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex and in T cells in the immune system. That opened up the possibility that we can now study social epigenetics in humans because no human will donate you his brain during his lifetime to study its DNA methylation changes. But if it happens in the immune system, you can do it. So we ask the question in these monkeys, the same with monkeys. We, we cannot sacrifice these monkeys during the study. These monkeys died for other reasons, so we could look at their brain. But we can look at their blood. How early does it develop? These were adults, right? The humans and the monkeys were adults. After 14 days of separation from the mother, you can already see these, these group of genes become less methylated. This group of genes become more methylated. The same thing I showed you before. It's an executive decision. The corporation called the nucleus is changing strategy. Hundreds and hundreds of genes are changing to adapt to that information that comes from the fact that you don't have a mother or you're maternally deprived. I call it the signature of the mother in your genome. The last study that I want to tell you about is how can you prove it in humans? I told you the only way to prove something is to randomize it. Because as much as I will show DNA methylation differences, let's say we, had a, we looked at the British Bear Court of 1958 and we looked at people with poverty and people with wealth and there were differences. But who says if they're not genetics? Certain British still believe that rich people deserve to be rich and poor deserve to be poor because they inherited it. They not only inherited money, they inherited the genes too. So perhaps those changes in methylation are all genetically predetermined. They're not caused by poverty. They are the reason why they are poor. The only way to study it is to look at natural disaster. So what we did is we took an opportunity with another colleague looking at a Quebec ice storm of 1998. Quebec Ice Storm of 1998 was the worst natural disaster that we had in Canada. And you know we are really a blessed country if this was our worst natural disaster. But it, wasn't, it was bad. Uh, we didn't have electricity for a long time. And uh, the temperature was minus 20 to minus 30. And um, people had to move to shelters. And it was stress. 
So Suzanne King followed mothers who were pregnant during that storm and followed their children for 15 years after that. And now she established an objective measure of storm, of stress. She called it the storm scale. For example, some people were with their mother-in-law. That could be stressful. <laughs> Others were in their country home. That's much less stressful. So the same random event of an ice storm translated in different ways in different people. And we did the methylation mapping in DNA of T cells of this 15-year-old kids and see how beautifully it lines up with increased storm. These genes get less methylated as, as the stress decreases or increases, and these genes get more methylated as the stress increases. If you can look at specific genes, you can see a very nice, almost linear relationship with the amount of objective stress that she established as a social scientist and the changes in methylation that we established as molecular biologists. So, I will show you only this to tell you that the difference between epigenetics and genetics is that we can do something about it. If somebody tells you you have this high-risk gene uh, for Parkinson, what are you going really to do about that? But if you have an epigenetic change, we can intervene to change it. So we found that during addiction, there is a dramatic epigenetic change. This is a rat model of addiction. And we asked the question, can we cure this addiction to cocaine of these rats by using epigenetic drugs? So the way addiction works in rats, you give them cocaine, like a pusher shows you some cocaine, then you're deprived of the cocaine, then another pusher comes after some time, gives you cocaine, and they go just crazy. They will push the lever to get as much cocaine as possible, like humans. At the time the pusher comes, that's a cue reminds you of the cocaine you took many, many years ago. The brain is opening up. We administer the epigenetic drug at that point. And you can see with one kind of drug, we reduced the craving. Another kind of drug aggravated the craving. So epigenetic drugs do have the potential of altering the way uh, our genome changes our behavior. So to summarize, the lifelong dynamic epigenome is, I believe, an adaptive response to the world. The critical time of early childhood is when a lot of these signals come in. They feed on the genome through signaling pathways that tweak the genome to create a phenotype that will fit with the world that that signaling tells you. But this never ends. Our phenotype is constantly in relationship with the world. The world keeps firing into that. And it fires it on it in different ways. So for example, if we take the rats that had a high mother or a low mother and we treat them with a drug called valproic acid, which is a mood stabilizer, but also an epigenetic drug, the response is totally different. So not only your genes define how you will react to drugs, but what kind of mother you had will also define how you will react to drugs. So this is a continuous dialogue. Our genomes accumulate stories of experience from past generations and from our early life, but continuously talk to the world and are altered based on their history. So history builds more history. And these interactions occur both with the chemical world and the social world. They both feed into our genomes. And I always tell, I'm invited a lot to Health Canada to talk about epigenetics, and they think I'm going to talk about PCB, about lead in the world, wall, and I tell them, what about a bullying boss? That's probably much more toxic than PCB in the wall. And what about your regulations that you stress the Canadian population with your regulations cause much more trouble than what you're protecting from with these regulations? The best example happened to me, the best school in the stupidity of humans is to go to the customs of the United States when you cross the border in Toronto at seven o'clock in the morning. There's 10,000 people who try to make their meetings in the United States with thousands of flights going over and you have to cross the border. There's this little baby. The guy wants to open the palm of her hand and check for gunpowder, the terrorist, because we're not profiling. Even though she's one year old, we're not profiling. So uh, the baby doesn't want to do that. That's a natural thing a baby does. The baby 
starts screaming. He fights with the baby. The baby fights with him. <laughs> Eventually, the baby jumps and runs away. They close now is a, is, a, is a threat to the security of the United States. So now they close the border. Thousands of people are missing their meetings. The damage to the economy is in the billions. And what was the risk? The stress that you caused to that child is probably outweighs the risk. So we need to start thinking in a more integrated way when we make decisions like this. What are we protecting from? And what damage we are causing by that protection? And it has to do with a new renaissance way of educating our children and ourselves that the social world and the chemical world are not disconnected. That humans are not brains walking on air like psychiatrists think, or bodies without brains like doctors think, that they are connected. And so the last part is to thank all the people that helped me uh, with this work. Some I mentioned and some I didn't. But there's a lot of collaborations going on, and a lot of alcohol has to be drunk to build those <laughs> collaborations. And uh, mostly I want to thank the methyl group. I was 19 years old when I started investigating that. And it kept me in business, got my kids into college. And of course, the granting agencies that supported me, and McGill University, which was home of these studies for almost three decades. Thank you. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. You've given us lots of food for thought there. And do be thinking what questions you want to ask. But there's some, some things I want to ask. I'm kind of not left knowing whether to feel optimistic because we're not at the mercy of our genes or pessimistic because you've, you've illustrated there the real damage that can be done, say, by things like early abuse. So is it, is it pessimistic in a sense that you can see lasting damage? That's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist, right? So when I see epigenetic, epigenetics, I see optimism. See, I started as a pharmacologist. So my job in life is to cure people, not to document their miseries. So uh, yes, there is misery, but there is potential for changing. And a potential for changing that epigenetics teaches us, and you don't have to be a hardcore biochemist to understand that, is that because of the reversibility of these processes, they could be changed. And the second message of optimism is they don't have to be done by chemicals, although I showed you chemicals here. But it's interesting. We do the chemical plus a behavioral therapy. So the cue is really what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. And CBT, psychiatrists are using it a lot. And so we give the cue to the animal, which is a behavioral therapy and a drug at the same time. And that solves the problem, solves the addiction. And it stays for months after that. So there's tremendous hope that we will be able to design behavioral therapies that will tap into these processes. So I am an optimist. However, what epigenetics teaches you is responsibility. And so responsibility of you to your genome, to the genome of your offspring, and to the genome of your friends and community. And if this is pessimism, some people will feel <laughs> pessimistic about it. It's much better to feel that whatever I can do is good. But I think it's optimistic. And there's already a lot of evidence about the long-term consequences of, of repeated exposure to adversity in, in early life, say. Is, is, does epigenetics do any more than just show us the chemical expression of that? I mean, is it telling us something new that we didn't know? The epigenetics is providing us with a mechanism. And we as humans need to have mechanisms to believe in something. So even though your grandmother told you that stress can cause cancer, we still don't believe that stress can cause cancer because we don't have a mechanism for that. Mechanisms are also very useful because with mechanisms you can start manipulating. You can start have markers by which you can study whether your manipulation is working. So I believe one day what it will do, it will turn mental well-being not to be different from physical well-being. And the same way that the doctor can measure your blood pressure and say, you're going to be in trouble, and give you drugs against blood pressure and can measure the blood pressure that they changed. If we have marks of adversity and they could be detected early, we don't care why they came. We don't care, did they come because you had sexual abuse or because your great-grandfather had sexual abuse? It's not important. We know you have the risk. We can identify the risk. We can start a treatment. We can see if that risk is modulated. So you called for some integrated thinking. Do you think that by looking more at the scientific evidence like this, we could then make a difference 
policy-wise, say, when it, when it comes to what to do about neglected oh, absolutely. children? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it already made a difference in the thinking of some people. And, for example, after we published the paper on the suicide, um, it was in the media, and we need the media to interpret it, of course, the, uh, the manuscript I wrote and the manuscript that was finally published was so arcane that even I couldn't understand it. <laughs> because they tell us they don't have enough space, so you have to cut it and cut it so that nobody can read it anymore. But then the media comes and explains it. And then the ex-Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney, he became interested in indigenous people in Canada. And what was an interesting thing that happened in Canada was that they took the good Christians who came to Canada, wanted to raise the Indians as good Christians. So the way to do it, they removed them from their parents into residential schools that were run by priests and nuns. And there was tremendous amount of abuse. But even without the abuse, just removing them from the parent, as you saw from the monkey, is the greatest abuse. And now we have third generations of, of aborig what we call aboriginal uh, populations that have the highest rate of suicide in the world. And he read that and he said, this starts making sense. And now let's start thinking about what we need to do about that. Because if it's epigenetic, we can change it. If it's genetic, we can say, oh, too bad. You're an Indian, you inherited bad genes. But if it's epigenetic, let's see what we can do. So I think it, it, even though Brian Mulroney has no understanding in science, but he has the common sense to understand this implies that. Now I understand what's going on, why grandchildren of people who were already raised by their parents, and they, but because their grandparents were in residential schools, they still have this high rate of suicide. And we know that people respond differently to the same traumatic events that different people might have gone through. Do you see a way in the future of being able to predict, say, which children, you know, to look genetically and be able to predict which children who've been through this are then going to suffer the most later on? Right. So this is a very active line of research in post-traumatic stress. There are certain genes that we know make people at risk to develop post-traumatic stress, but only if they experienced adversity early in life. And there were a number of studies not showing that what the adversity does, it changes the methylation of those genes in a way that now make them susceptible. So I think a combination of resilience is one of the most important things that you mentioned here. And if you followed my talk, the methylation changes I suggested are not created to make our life miserable. They are created to adapt us. So the question is why in certain people it adapts those people and in other people it doesn't. So I think part of it has to do with changing environments. So even though you were exposed to the same epigenetic change early in life, if environment changed later in life, as for example, those monkeys that now are in a cafeteria in California and they have access to food. So those adaptive things become maladaptive. So I think what we will need to understand is even though everybody exp was exposed to trauma and everyone had child abuse, some people react differently because the history in between was very different. And in that history is what we need to understand because there where intervention potential is. So that's optimistic again because yeah. that's where you can change the next bit yes. of what happens instead. I've got more questions I want to ask, but I want to throw things open. We've got, um, there are people with roving mics. Please wait for the mic to get to you and definitely speak into it. Um, if you can stand up, that's, ev that's even better. Um, and um, who we've got, we have somebody at the back just there. Fellow. Um, you touched Can you speak right into the mic? Thanks, we can't. Anita Panwani Fellow. Um, you touched on individuals' experience post a traumatic event. Um, are there also cultural factors that influence uh, an individual's perception of uh, the risks and threats around them? Absolutely. So, culture and community are environments, are social environments. They feed into the same machinery. And the way they feed into it could be increasing or decreasing resilience. And it's quite clear that different populations respond to stress differently. And one thing that amazed me was, I am interested now in post-traumatic stress, and unfortunately, the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States have been in war for some time, and there's post-traumatic stress in all of these countries, and the armies are trying to deal with this, and there are terrible stories coming out. What surprised me is, why didn't it come out after World War II? And we never heard about that. Um, and so I, um, I went to Israel because, uh, to, do, to do a study there because there the soldiers draw blood before they go to war, and I think it's the same in the United States and other countries. 
Then they go to war, and then some develop and some don't develop post-traumatic stress. So if we can do the methylation before they go to war, and after they come back, we can find the differences. And then I expected a, a rate of post-traumatic stress which is similar to Canada and the, United, and the United States, and it's much lower. So we talked with a psychiatrist of the army, why does it think so? Why is it much lower in Israel than... And he told me two things. I mean, there's no evidence, but something to think. One thing is the soldiers in Israel are much closer from the battlefield to home. So most soldiers will come home every week for the weekend. So even though they're exposed to the trauma during the week, they are at home with their mothers and fathers and loving siblings during the weekend, which is not true for American soldiers who are separated from their families for months and months, the same with Canadian soldiers. And the second thing is the attitude of society towards the soldiers. So these are therapeutic environments. We create with culture therapeutic environments. Culture is all part of the same kind of mixture by which humans adapt to trouble. And, uh, and they have a huge impact on the way our epigenomes work. We're not living on our own. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, there's somebody in the second row just here. Hello, I'm Stephanie Beitzel. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I'm, a, I'm very interested in the study that you have of separation of children from their pe mothers. Obviously, it's, it's had a big impact. I'm interested to know what study might have been done of children being separated from their fathers. This has come to my attention recently with a number of friends, um, same-sex female couples who are having children and choosing to never have the father in the child's life. And I'd just be interested to know what you think the impact would be. Fathers are the underrepresented in research. And the reason is because our animal models, like the monkeys that I showed you, uh, the father plays no role in, in the monkey life. The father is a breeder, that's it. And once he stops breeding, he's out of the game. These are maternal hierarchies, the grandmother, the, the daughter, they take care of the, of, the, of the offspring, not the father. In humans, of course, we develop differently. And I think one amazing thing in human evolution is the increasing role of the father in raising the children. So we can see evolution even in our times, how society expects the father to take a more intensive role in taking care of the children. And people are starting to study that, but it's very poorly studied. We are very maternal and biased in, in looking at it, just because of the models that we have from, from the mammal world. Any other questions? Yes, there's somebody over here on the right. Hi, my name is Jing Han. I'm an anthropology student at UCL. And I was just wondering, um, how do you think epigenetics would be related to the discussion on surrogate mothers? Because a lot of DNA methylation should be in the womb, wouldn't it? And wouldn't the risk be sort of like underplayed? Because if you give it to a surrogate mother, the whole process and the whole prospect of giving away the child, that should induce a lot of stress, wouldn't it? Yes. Of course, surrogates, surrogacy is a really exciting question. So if you look at, at the genetic point of view, it shouldn't make a difference because it's the gene of the father and mother uh, and it just passed through a surrogate. And that's how geneticists will say. However, if you look at epigenetics, pregnancy is a very critical time. We now can see at, on, in cord blood, so these are babies just born, methylation signatures of their maternal stress and of the food that the mother ate, of the life the mother lived, the surrogate mother. So I would say that kid is a hybrid of the, ancestry, the genetic Darwinian ancestry and the epigenetic ancestry that he gets from the surrogate market. And there's a very interesting question about citizenship, about religion. For example, in Judaism, there's a question, Judaism is defined by the mother. Who is the mother? Is it the genetic mother who gave the eggs or is it the surrogate mo mother? And actually most rabbis will say it's the surrogate mother. We don't ask genetic questions when we define religion. It's an epigenetic pheno phenomenon. That's why people can convert. They change their epigenetic environment, and now they become members of a new religion. The United States is an epigenetic nation, right? People came from many, many different ethnic backgrounds, but now you look at them, you know who is an American. You immediately can recognize an American because and it doesn't make a difference if he's black, if he's, if he's oriental, if he's white, if he's from German origin, British origin, you know he's an American. He's not any more British, he's not any more German. It's an epigenetic change. 
And I think we will start to realize that. And, and you know, there's issues of inheritance of law that are involved with, with this question. Do you, do you think in the future, as, as more and more is learned about what's happening in the time when the baby is in the womb, do you think in the future we'll see more demands from society on what women can do in that time and almost restrictions? So generally, I think we should not have more restrictions because I think they add stress. But I think what we need is to have a narrative that the women can follow. Societies develop narratives, right? And narratives are, are all encompassing. Right, to tell you who you are, where you come from, who your family is, what are you supposed to do. And I think part of the narrative is how women are treated during pregnancy. And different communities have different narratives for how to treat. What we'll develop is a narrative rather than restrictions. I think restrictions go against the way the human body works. We are extremely stressed by, by restriction and the damage that they cause outweighs the benefit but we love narratives. We associate with narratives and we, uh, they integrate our, our being with, with our past and with our community. Oh, lots of questions. Uh, yes, somebody third row back, just here. Uh, thanks. Uh, name is Saji Khan. Um, a lot of food for thought there, but one uh, thing which just... Uh, I thought I'd put in front of you is the, the fact for women or mothers with this mitochondria, which yeah. is, I mean, when I qualified in 1956, <laughs> mitochondria, nobody knew what it was all about. And now it's the powerhouse of the, mm -hmm. especially female side. Right. Uh, you mentioned about the Jewish connection. Right. Thanks. So mitochondrial DNA is interesting. We only inherit it from our mothers. So by looking at your mitochondrial DNA, you can really find your female ancestor. And, you know, of course, the mitochondrial DNA changes just with time, but you can, uh, with good genetics, find out who your ancestor is, uh, which again stresses that the contribution of father and mother, even at that level, are not the same. But a good anecdote is, you know, Jews claim that they go by their mother. So they looked at mitochondrial DNA of Jews to find out if they have common ancestry. And a recent paper in Nature Communication found out that the mitochondrial DNA of European Jews is traced to Europeans who lived 30,000 years ago in Europe. So here goes the narrative. But the narrative is still okay. And because narratives are just narratives. They don't have to be truthful. They can have a huge impact by being a lie. And so, you know, when we develop narratives of how society deals with women, with pregnant women, with mothers, the narrative itself has huge power to change the way our genes are expressed, and therefore they become the truth just because of the power that they have. Okay, any more questions? Yes, somebody at the back <coughs> in the corner there. Uh, Neil Allen, this is, um, a, it might be a bit of bleak to this, but. Um, has, has the work that you've done or your colleagues done shown, thrown any light on things like ASD, ADHD, dyslexia, anything, those sorts of conditions uh, that, you know, obviously have some effect? So, obviously you, you, you touch on, on, on really important questions that we don't have an answer to, but I know my colleagues are interested in. So I never looked at dyslexia, but I was invited to talk in dyslexia um, workshops and and so what we're doing in, you know, let's say in abuse is translated by researchers in dyslexia to dyslexia. And ADHD is a really interesting one. I just heard a talk about the impact of media on the increasing rate of ADHD in our children. And this researcher took um, mice and exposed them to a Sesame Street uh, mouse version and they became hyperactive. <laughs> but when he exposed them to uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, I don't know if you have this in the UK, it's a kind of a, a more calm version of, Sesame Street is the super ADHD kind of way of training your kids. These mice were calm. And if you look at the brains of children who were exposed to high power changing media, their brains are different. The anatomy of the brain is different because they now adapt to this world, a boom, boom, boom world, and they develop a boom, boom, boom personality, which is 
adaptive to a boom, boom, boom world, right? Uh, but is that the narrative you want to train them into? So I stopped my grandchildren, no one see Sesame Street anymore. We tried to find all the old videos of uh, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood to expose them to. Uh, yes, there's somebody who's there in the back. Thank you, Mike Leonestis. I'm a professor at UCL, not of genetics or microbiology. Uh, I have a question about time scale. I mean, we know in terms of evolution, in terms of Cavalli's thoughts as well, how long it takes for races to develop characteristics. What you were talking about shows an immediacy. So, if I'm told off my, my father, it just stays with me, does it? So, the, the, it's a very good question. And, and a big difference between natural selection, which is, you know, Darwin's evolution, uh, and, and what I'm trying to, to tell you today is, is time scale. Uh, first, it, it offers a faster way for evolution. And, um, you know, evolutionaries have struggled, even Darwin himself, with periods that he felt that evolution moved too fast for just a regular natural selection to be at work. And they might explain that. They don't only, these processes are not only immediate, they're organized, right? So natural selection works randomly. Your genes mutate randomly, and there's some force that selects for it, whereas these are processes that react. So there was a very interesting paper published recently, and I know the BBC had a story on it, about transmitting fear from odor, from a smell, across three generations of mice through the germline. So a mouse is conditioned to be afraid of a certain smell because it comes together with an electric shock. The grandchildren of that mouse, when they recognize that smell, they will startle. So we always thought that odor sensitivity is selected by natural selection, right? For example, mice are very afraid of fox urine because foxes eat mice, and so they smell the urine, they run away, and that was survival. So natural selection selected for mice to recognize fox urine. Now we see that it can happen through this process. And I think it has implications on, you know, domestication of animals. You know we can domesticate foxes to become dogs or wolves to become dogs, and we can turn dogs to become wolves. And is this all natural selection? Domestication goes very fast in mice. You can domesticate a mice and, and back, back into the wild. And they develop complete different phenotypes, complete different looks when they're in the wild. So I think epigenetics will provide a lot of answers to, to open questions in evolutionary theory that still geneticists have a hard time understanding because they're fixated on you know, natural selection and, and random mutations. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there's somebody at the back just there, and then we'll go over there. Hi, I'm David Thomas, I'm a teacher. Um, I'm really intrigued by the, the role of age in this um, because you talked about the process being dynamic and it being able to go on through your life, but a lot of the studies and a lot of what you said focused on early years and right. the importance of early years. So I'm wondering if there is a role of age in how dynamic this process is, or if it is constant at a sort of rate all the way through your life? It's definitely not constant. We know that. We know there are more critical times than others. And I think critical times are when the system is physiologically opened. For example, puberty. The hormones open up the system. That's time when information can come in. And this is how the cue works, you know, and, and when we treat with cocaine or when the psychiatrist does cognitive behavioral therapy, it opens up the brain. Now it's time for readjustment. Aging is another time where there's dramatic DNA methylation changes happening. And actually, mice lose the activity of the enzyme that methylates DNA as they age. And the only common thing between mice and humans is losing that enzyme. And as we age, we keep losing methyl marks. And actually, by giving that enzyme to mice, we can extend their life, extend their cognitive ability. And there are some nutritional supplements that one can play with that I'm trying to play now in, with Alzheimer's um, cases that you can kind of, So we see that aging is a very critical time for these processes. And I believe we're starting to understand that aging might be driven by those changes. There was, yes, third row just here. Hi, I'm Alexandra Fleming. I'm an editor for a scientific journal. Um, I've got a molecular question. Um, now, methylation marks, that's, that's sort of quite a simple mark, methyl group or no methyl group, and mm -hmm. a handful of methylases are known, a handful of demethylases, mm -hmm. and a couple of drugs that kind of work. But 
where does the specificity come in in terms of creating these like incredibly sophisticated landscapes of methylation and right. demethylation and how close are we in creating drugs that can influence them in a directed way? Right, so the specificity comes, I think, uh, based on you know, the study that we showed in the beginning with the maternal care. There's a transcription factor. A transcription factor is a protein that is a postman. It can go to the genome. If I send a, a letter to John in the United Kingdom, there's no way it can get there. And that's your question, you know, how, how does, I want to change John in the United Kingdom. But if I say John who lives on this street, you know, Oxford Street 36, and the zip code is that, the postman knows how to read that address and get the letter to John. The same is transcription factors. They have an ability to recognize addresses in the genome. So when a signal comes, it modifies those transcription factors, which now can go to particular addresses and change them in a very organized way in response to that signal. Hormones are other elements that can integrate those things. So one question you should ask is, how does the germline know that I'm stressed? So, um, so our, t our testis has a lot of glucocorticoid receptors, and nobody understood what they're doing. So the hypothesis now is that when you're stressed, and your brain is secreting is not secreting glucocorticoids, but it's telling the command to your adrenal to secrete glucocorticoids. So here's the brain, and the adrenal is on top of your kidney. It secretes those glucocorticoids. They can go to the sperm, and now they act on receptors. These receptors have addresses in the genome. So we can start thinking, although it's completely enigmatic at this stage, but there are some rational ways uh, of explaining how this could happen. But now you ask another question is, if this is so complicated and so sophisticated, how on earth will we be able to change that? And it's amazing that we do. We are able to change it. And in quite an organized way. But I think the organization comes by opening up the system at specific times. So the idea that we have with mental health is to combine it with cognitive therapy. And what cognitive therapy does, it opens the pathways in the brain that are involved in this particular disorder. And at that time, the drugs will be highly selective to those pathways that are open. And so both in cancer therapy and in, they do have nonspecific effects, but they do have remarkable specific effects that change things in a way you want if you direct them at the right time. So there are two answers. One is, yes, maybe one day we'll have drugs that will hit the pathways that coordinate that. But another one is perhaps the challenge of the doctors, and doctors got very good with it, for example, in cancer therapy, is not so much in changing the drug, but is in changing the way the drug is administered. By dosing and scheduling, you can actually gain a lot of specificity. And I think in mental health, it will be dosing, scheduling, and cueing. And, and that the pow that's the power of the brain, because the brain could be opened up by behavioral therapy. So could you see a time when we could have specific drugs developed in order to try to counteract some of the specific consequences of, say, early abuse, rather than drugs that are trying to then deal with mental health problems, which might sometimes result in some people? Right. So I think that we will have to... I don't think it will be easy. <laughs> I think it will be much easier to learn how to work with general drugs um, than to develop particular drugs, because we don't really know, and probably will never know exactly what genes we need to affect, but we know that machinery is involved. So I think a lot of the game of a good physician is actually learning how to do that. And, um, and, and again, uh, you know, survival in cancer has improved a lot, not by new drugs, there are very few new drugs, but mostly by doctors learning how to well work with the old drugs. They're doing an amazing job in it. We've got time for one more question. There was somebody over here, yes, on the, on the right. I just wanted to ask about um, the nature of the implications, because you seem to have mostly focused on sort of top-down interventions for individuals. But it seemed to me, listening to the talk, that the main thing seemed to be that society has to be much more equal, and these are almost inevitable consequences of societal problems. And focusing on individuals is almost focusing on the symptoms rather than the cause. I agree with, with what you've said now, that, you know, because we have to look at humans as integrated with, with society, and therefore intervention at the societal level could be either harmful or positive in a big way. 
Um, but we have to also understand the limitations of biology. So for example, if inequality creates a lot of those problems that we see, can we really solve inequality? I was asked this question a few times by journalists. And of course, the, the, the true communists believe that they can solve inequality. But I think the experience of communism has told us that you solve one inequality to create another inequality. And when you look at animals, at the way animals are structured, inevitably, you put five fish in a tank, there will be hierarchies formed. There will be dominant structures formed. Inequality is built in our evolutionary story. And I believe it's adaptive. It's to protect us, because we need a leader sometimes. So this natural tendency to develop classes, to develop leadership versus you know, followers, is spread out in evolution. So the question is, how do we take biology seriously and tap into this basic biological possibility? I am a communist by nature, but I was hit many times. The first time when I was a young professor, I was teaching my medical students, and the first question they ask is, what will be in the exam? And I told them that when your patient comes to you and you kill him because you forgot something that I told you, you were not telling him it wasn't in the exam. So you have to know everything. The second thing I told them, everybody now gets 100, and let's start learning, really. Because I th always thought that giving people grades for becoming a doctor, why does a doctor care if he got 100 or 80? He has to be a doctor. He has to treat people. So he has to be obsessed all day trying to learn to do his job. But it was a total failure. The students complained. Why did we all get 100? Because I'm so much better than he is. <laughs> and we got the same mark. And so I realized that there is a certain level of inequality that is fundamental. But I believe, having said that, I'm not pessimistic. We know that we can have more or less inequality. For example, if you compare Cuba to the United Kingdom, inequality in the United Kingdom is much bigger than it is in Cuba. And if you look at health in Cuba, in spite of their poverty, they're doing extremely well. Because they do have a gradient. There, is leaders of the, there are leaders of the Communist Party that are doing better than the average you know, Cuban. But the gradient is different. So the challenge in life is not to ignore biology because of ideology and to be respectful to biology, but at the same time, by understanding it, moving human evolution, you know, by creating narratives that can allow us to tap into biology in a way that, that, that is going the way we think is, we deserve to go to. We are running out of time now, so we will have to leave it there, but that's been absolutely fascinating. We've covered a huge range of subjects, it seems, and this seems to definitely be an, an area to watch. But um, thank you very much for the, to the NSPCC for arranging this tonight. Um, but please join me in thanking uh, very much Moshe Schiff. That was brilliant. Thank you.